Atlanta is one of the top cities in the country, and with good reason. From its colorful and exciting history to its current position as a center of culture and commerce and the home of the 1996 Olympic Summer Games, Atlanta is a wonderful place. There are many nights in this city where every single shelter bed is full, yet they're still homeless people. Where are they to go? There is no place. They can't go to a park, they can't go to a sidewalk, they can't go under a bridge, they can't go on private property. If they sleep, if they lay their heads down, and they don't have a choice to do that. If they do that, they are breaking the law. The 1996 Olympic Games to the city of Atlanta. Well, it's difficult to really start with the Olympics itself because I think they intensified already existing, an existing war against the homeless. And I think a key document there is uh, the 1987-88 uh, Central Area Study put together by Central Atlanta Progress, which sort of outlined a strategy for revitalizing downtown. And a key part of that strategy was the removal of uh, vagrants, as they call it, or the homeless population from the Central Atlanta area, which encompasses both downtown and, and midtown. And that they uh, put a, you know, together a game plan that, that called for, I guess, what, they, what did they refer to it then as a sort of hospitality zone, a vagrant-free hospitality zone that would be sort of uh, police to keep the, uh, the poor and the homeless out and make it you know, exclusively for um, you know, tourists and uh, visitors and conventioneers and residents and office workers and anyone but you know, the sort of uh, the most disadvantaged of Atlanta's population. Uh, people liken the, um, the Olympics to a sort of invasion, and it certainly was. I mean, the world came here for a certain amount of time. We spent six years you know, redoing the city, but we don't really have you know, much to show for it on, on the social side. I mean, we can point to, you know, a new stadium for the Braves and, you know, some new pedestrian um, corridors and such and dorms for Georgia State. But they're really, the social legacy in terms of a new, you know, uh, mechanism for linking the different segments of Atlanta's segre uh, fragmented population, that's not there. The Olympics was sort of a coalescing of oppositional forces against people who are visibly homeless or, or folks who are homeless being visible. Um, because there's been some feeling that we've noticed as long as I've done this work for almost 13 years, that people who are homeless or who look poor shouldn't be visible if we want to have a clean, um, pleasant city that attracts business and tourists. But what we saw was that um, some of the powerful folks in the downtown community believed that they were sort of on a roll. You know, they began to institute these policies before the Olympics. And when the games were over, the PR started, well, we've taken back our city, let's keep it. We sincerely believe that requiring appropriate standards of public behavior has had a very positive effect for improving the environment of our public spaces and also significantly reducing crime in the downtown area. The new nuisance ordinances were passed, the, 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 they're called the quality of life ordinances, after the Olympics. When the ordinances were being um, discussed in terms of whether they were going to become law or not, <clears throat> several of the city council persons argued among their own colleagues to not pass such an ordinance. People cannot live in parks and the parks, be, and the parks remain parks. They're not made for that. There are no living facilities in the parks. To listen to someone say that God's green earth, which is a park, is not a livable space is unbelievable to me. The urban camping ordinance is but one of a series of ordinances that have been incredibly labeled quality of life ordinances. One made it a crime to loiter in a vacant building. One made it a crime to panhandle. Uh, and there were uh, ordinances prohibiting remaining in a parking lot uh, or loitering in general. And all those ordinances, and there's about a half a dozen of them, uh, were passed after Atlanta was selected for the Olympic Games uh, with the efforts of Central Atlanta Progress. Central Atlanta Progress is a nonprofit corporation that represents the 200, roughly 200 largest downtown businesses and property owners in the Central Atlanta area. 
And uh, the present group uh, exists, uh, basically dates from uh, 1967 when it was incorporated. But in one form or another, it dates back to 1941 when it originated as the Central Atlanta Improvement Association. And then in the 50s, it became the Central Atlanta Association. But basically, this group is of you know, major private sector leaders with a stake, a financial stake in downtown. And they've taken a leading role in planning uh, the future of uh, the central part of the city. CAP wants to make downtown Atlanta a, quote, safe, clean, and user-friendly city, which has led me and a bunch of other people to say essentially what they're doing here is essentially theme parking downtown, like what's taking place in many other American cities, or disnifying it, if you want to use a sort of, you know, a sort of catchy phrase. And, uh, you know, developers like James Rouse, who are responsible for underground as well as others, you know, adopt this sort of... Uh, sort of uh, thematic vision, very clean, ordered, controlled environment that doesn't have the homeless, the poor, or whatever, and is oriented towards relatively well-heeled you know, consumers and presents a fairly cheery vision um, of the urban landscape in contrast to the sort of deterioration and, and decay and poverty that characterizes you know, uh, a, good, a good chunk of the city. The safe, clean, user-friendly idea is really something that's been taking hold since the mid-1980s when CAP realized that they had to develop a new plan to deal with the unintended consequences of their earlier plans that basically allowed private capital to do whatever it wanted downtown. I think Central Atlanta Progress continues to not want homeless people to be uh, in the sight of the downtown community. And the way they do that is they send them off to jail and they make our jails homeless shelters. Well, I think there's a, a trend in, in urban areas across the country to criminalize homelessness. Uh, and Atlanta is at, at the, the front of that trend. Uh, the National Coalition for the Homeless uh, did a study and found that Atlanta had some of the, what they termed the meanest streets uh, for the homeless of any cities in the country. Uh, so Atlanta is the, the, supposedly the city too busy uh, to hate uh, is, is has it's the meanest streets for the homeless population. Atlanta simply says, if you are homeless, you cannot lie down or sleep in a public space. And it says, if you go on private property, we will arrest you. If you go on public property, we will arrest you. So you have two choices, get out of town or die. One of the reasons why central Atlanta is in such a poor state that it is, is that you had these private developers like uh, Tom Cousins and John Portman building the Omni Complex and building Peachtree Center that sucked all the life out of the Five Points area, out of Fairleigh Poplar, you know, took the people off the streets, closed the stores, moved them to these little, you know, enclaved, uh, privileged realms. And then, you know, in the late 1980s, with the development of areas like Midtown and Buckhead and Perimeter, and uh, Cumberland Galleria, you had the banks and the insurance companies and the lawyers and the uh, real estate firms and all the service industries that fed off these trades moving out of the center to, um, to the periphery or the peripheries. And nowadays, when you take a look at uh, the media and uh, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and politicians and the like, and they blame the presence of the homeless for the exodus of these corporate tenants, rather than looking at these other you know, factors that are you know, perhaps just you know, certainly more powerful in, in shaping these migrations outward and, and creating uh, the sort of landscape we have downtown right now, which is, is sort of you know, vacant and emptied and um, a problem of the first order. Woodruff Park, you know, had been envisioned um, as a sort of a green space downtown for office workers to, uh, you know, eat their lunches and such. And from the outset, uh, office workers had to share that park with a variety of other, you know, urban, you know, users, including the homeless. And as the homeless uh, population increased, their presence in the park increased. After 5 o'clock and during the weekends, uh, the park had become a center for um, various kinds of, you know, soup kitchens and, and, and the provision of services for the homeless by a variety of volunteer groups. Many of the services that were formerly provided there prior to the, the, the makeover are no longer provided there. Um, and there have been various efforts to sort of uh, refigure the landscape, 
uh, take away, uh, you know, uh, you know, benches, make sleep-proof benches, uh, plant sharp, uh, you know, thorny plants uh, under trees where people would sleep, um, and and otherwise make it a, a less hospitable uh, environment for for the homeless and the urban poor, as well as for other marginal groups in the city, as well as enhance policing and. You know, that's where the urban camping uh, ordinance and various other laws that have been targeted against the homeless really come into play. It's both manifest in, in the built environment of the park, but also more, more powerfully in the legal ordinances that sort of surround the park. The media have not been very balanced about anything, not about just about the homeless, but about urban redevelopment in, in general. Uh, they have tended to, you know, focus almost exclusively on articulating the vision of the of the downtown elite, the public and private sectors, and not really assessing whether or not past plans have actually had the results that they were intended. And they have not really peeked behind the veneer of things to uh, to see what's going on. Now, in part, also, I mean, the AJC, you know, is a major stakeholder in downtown. And certainly has a sort of very vested, you know, interest in seeing downtown improve and attract, you know, high-end boutiques and cafes and you know, wealthy condos and, and such. And uh, the presence of a large homeless population sort of militates uh, against that kind of, you know, rebirth for the area. But what I refuse to accept in my neighborhood is turning over the control of my streets and my parks and my public spaces on a day-to-day -day basis to the lowest people in our society. The business improvement district kind of um, arena in planning circles, downtown business district planning circles, are, are preaching the gospel of incarceration and oppression in downtown communities because there's been a growth of homelessness, because poverty is more extreme and people who are poor are more likely to experience homelessness. So the problem's grown, as the problem's grown, the fear and the, the demonizing of it has grown, as if the existence of homeless people impacts the business district, which there is no evidence of. We like to say sort of sarcastically, homelessness is not a blood type. It's an experience that people who are poor have. And more and more, 22% roughly, of the people who are living in poverty experience homelessness. And more and more often, they experience it cyclically, maybe one or more times. But but the uh, the the absence of one or two paychecks could spin lots of us into homelessness. Task force is the central coordinating agency for services to homeless people, and we operate a 24-hour hotline. We're here 24 hours a day, seven days a week, trying to get homeless people to the services that they need, from housing to employment opportunities to clothing, food, the works. But of the people who call us, 37%, when they call saying, I need a shelter to go to, are working. Now, they usually lose their jobs if they stay homeless, right. because maintaining that is very difficult. Tree Pine Building, which has caused an incredible amount of controversy in this city and has demonized me and the task force right, right thoroughly, has been a boon to us because of the gap in services and because the people are downtown and quite clearly need to be gotten inside or need to be uh, invited inside so that they're not available and vulnerable to arrest. It seems to me a no-brainer that folks would say, great, we've got a building they can go in, they can be cleaned up, they can take a shower have a mailbox, have a locker, get information about a job, get a shelter bed or transitional facility, be bused to wherever they need to go. That, that just seems to me to be an exciting option and opportunity. But the opposition thinks not. Just as regarding the Peachtree Pine building, there are groups who just have a fundamental disagreement, and I'm one of them, that fundamentally disagrees with the plan for Peachtree Pine. And the things that concern me greatly are the size of the building, uh, just congregating seven, I've heard different figures, seven to nine hundred people in one location is very difficult to manage. There are lots of folks who believe that we're invading the downtown community and 
we say homeless people are already there. What we're doing is opening the doors to make sure they have hospitality, decent work, and a place to live and get clean. But November 18, 1996 is also a date that the poor and the homeless citizens of Atlanta will always remember. That was a cold day. It was the winter time. It was around the Thanksgiving holiday. And they passed such an ordinance knowing there was no room in the end. I'm very uh, happy with the demonstration that took place on August 28th. Of course, uh, that day was selected because it commemorated the 34th anniversary of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. And of course, we, knew, we know that that speech talked about how America and all of its resources had a segment of its population uh, on an island of poverty. And we know that speech talks about the fact that every person has, should be uh, worthy of inherent respect due to the dignity of each human life. We were able to reach out and, and, and seize the moment for that spirit of that day to the religious community, which was concerned black clergy, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, and other organizations that really wanted to not, wanted to let the homeless community know that there are still people who care. And that we are organizing and that we are going to send a message in November that no longer can you take us for granted. We marched from three different locations, starting at Dr. King's tomb on Auburn Avenue. We met there that morning and had prayer. And then SCLC marched to City Hall. Concerned pla uh, black clergy marched from Centennial Park. And myself uh, marched with the homeless community from uh, the largest soup kitchen here in Atlanta, St. Louis. And we all converged upon Woodruff Park and marched in together, by which we had what we call Speak Out for Justice. And what was so beautiful about that was that it was the first time, I think, that for many of the homeless, that they had an opportunity to, to speak and to be heard and to be listened to and to feel like someone cared. Well, we were originally involved in uh, opposing the city council in their efforts to pass, originally pass the urban camping ordinance. And we testified against the ordinance, uh, both in committee and before the full council, and uh, attempted to uh, develop some kind of compromise that would address the city's concerns without uh, discriminating against homeless people. And uh, the city declined our offer and passed the ordinance. The vote is now closed. Ten yeas, five nays. I rise in opposition to the urban camping ordinance. I am a legal director of the Georgia ACLU and lead counsel on Richardson versus the City of Atlanta, which is the lawsuit challenging the urban camping ordinance. Uh, well, we filed a lawsuit uh, last month um, as a class action. Uh, we filed it on behalf of all homeless persons, uh, all persons who are now or may be homeless, uh, in the city of Atlanta. And we have asked that the law be declared unconstitutional, that it be struck from the books. Uh, and we've also asked that in the alternative, uh, the city can only enforce the ordinance if it provides adequate shelter space and tra transitional housing for homeless people. Uh, because the city council said time and again that this ordinance, they said, was not directed at homeless people. So we're asking the judge to put them at their word. I have a stack of every citation that's ever been issued for urban camping in my office. And those citations show that almost every person that was arrested for urban camping was homeless. If you go to Piedmont Park on any given day, you'll see hundreds of people laying down, sleeping, and you'll see officers walking right by them. Uh, but those people are clearly have a home and have some money. and. Uh, if a homeless person is doing the exact same conduct, uh, they're going to be taken to jail and sit in jail for a number of days. I, I think we have a very good case. Uh, I mean, this ordinance, uh, these types of ordinances have, have generally been struck down. A few have been upheld. 
Uh, but Atlanta's ordinance uh, really is directed at the very conduct that makes someone homeless. And uh, Atlanta's lack of shelter space is so uh, profound and the alternatives are so limited for homeless people uh, that we feel you know, very positive about the outlook of the case and obviously we're hoping that the, the city council will see uh, better judgment and, and look at repealing or revising the ordinance themselves. The language is absolutely essential to sort of uh, reaffirm and to sort of create, uh, create greater support for uh, what they are attempting to do um, downtown. Quality of life means um, that you, to me, we, we look at the most vulnerable people in our society, in our community, and measure what the quality of their lives is, and we guarantee um, a standard of living for everybody, which means a right to housing, health care, decent living wage employment, um, and education, which would mean child care for underage children. So I would think that these would be guarantees in our, in our community.